Hey, what's up guys? And welcome to my brand new radar detector and laser jamming testing platform. This is my Audi Q5 freshly installed with a ton of awesome equipment. Last week I drove down to Musicar Northwest based out of Portland, Oregon, and they did an incredible install of all this equipment here in my vehicle. Now, while I was down there, I was documenting the whole thing and I learned a ton about installation. I mean, I had my ideas as far as kind of functionally where I wanted stuff to go, but uh, they made it look way better than anything I could have dreamed. Like they have some really incredible ideas and I wanna share with you guys, not only the end result of everything that they created, but also the build process and their thought process behind where everything went and why. This was really, really cool. Again, I learned a whole ton and I wanna go ahead and share this with you guys. Now, the purpose of this build, again, is not to have a bunch of equipment to run all at the same time. Like, you could do that, of course, but it's gonna be a little crazy whenever all the stuff starts going off. So obviously that's not gonna be very usable. Plus you're gonna run into issues with the different radar detectors interfering with one another or different laser jammers actually maybe trying to jam each other instead of the police officers. Marksman interference Front detection. Laser. Only. Marksman or ultralight 2020. So this isn't designed to have a bunch of systems to run at the same time. It's designed to make it really easy for me to test and compare lots of different systems. So uh, maybe one day I'll run one system and then the next day I'll run another system and maybe, you know, I'll run it for a week or however long. And it makes it really easy for me uh, to compare a lot of systems in the real world. And then also once we get to testing, uh, it's really easy to just switch between different systems. Uh, in my last car, I had like custom mounts that I'd built for the remote radar detectors and whatnot. And then eventually I actually installed them in the grill. But uh, this time I wanted to get everything installed beautifully and professionally right out of the gate to make it a lot easier for me. Now I did a lot of the install on my Miata myself, but it wasn't that great. And that's why I wanted to actually go to a professional this time. The guys at Music Car, uh, from the outside, it's a pretty unassuming building, but when you head inside, you can see all the incredible work that they're doing. And I actually just did a video recently. You can click the button on screen or the link in the video description uh, to see a lot of the other installs that were going on at the same time that they were doing my vehicle. Now, I'm sure you guys are also really excited to uh, go ahead and get to the install. Now, there's a ton of equipment, and so down in the video description, I'm actually gonna have a full list of everything that's installed, plus links to everything for more information, or if you wanna pick something up for your car too. But now let's go ahead and take a closer look at all the different equipment that's gonna be going into the Q5. And we've got uh, the AOP here, I've got some regular heads, some TX sensors, and another regular head as well, so I can switch between uh, regular versus TX combinations. Uh, net radar DSP, uh, one's a net radar DSP, the rear antenna is gonna be a regular net radar since I only have one. Uh, I've got uh, some laser guns for testing. The AOPs are gonna be running both front and rear. Up front, I'm also gonna be running a TMG triple. Escort just sent over a Max CI 360. So we've got front and rear radar, uh, M7 up front, M3 plus for the rear. Uh, we've got a set of quads, which I'm gonna be running up front in various combinations of duals, triples, and quads. We've got the display, controller, CPU, and GPS antenna. We've got the Redenso RCM that Redenso has sent over. So we're gonna be running front and rear for this as well. We've got a Stinger VIP that we're gonna be running up front. I'm also gonna be getting Stinger standalone laser transmitters to run up front with the uh, fiber optic transmit received. That's actually gonna be coming in this week, so I'm gonna be doing a self-install once I get home when that arrives. Inside the cabin, I've already got some radar detectors mounted on the windshield using suction cups and blend mounts and mirror taps. I've got the Blackview DR900S up front and the DR750S in the rear. For the side cameras, to give me a four-channel solution, I've got the uh, two quote-unquote rear dash cams, which I'm gonna be running as side cams. And then to power all the dash cams, I got a combination of Blackview and cell link batteries. And then to power everything, instead of doing a whole bunch of T-taps, like you can see here, I used to have on the uh, hardwire cable for the dash cam battery, I ordered the Rig Runner 4008, which is something that a number of you guys recommended. Basically, it makes expansion and powering things super easy. It's got an input port here and then eight different output ports, so I can easily plug in with the connectors right here. Uh, up to eight different systems. Now, before going to have everything professionally installed, I needed a little bit of equipment in my car, so I went ahead and installed, uh, you know, an R3 and a Max 360C in the car, just so I've got some radar detectors, and for power, I just uh, plugged them in as far as a mirror tap. It made it really easy to power in without having to deal with any sort of custom power and ground on the fuse box, it just, boom, right behind the rearview mirror. That worked out really well. The Max 360C I put on a blend mount so it makes the uh, mounting look a lot nicer. Plus I've also got the uh, adapter for the GoPro so I can mount that under my rear view mirror. And that's actually how I do all my videos as far as uh, when the radar detector is mounted low on the windshield. Speaking of cameras, I went ahead and just put in some dash cams front and rear and uh, wired them up to battery packs so that I could plug into the cigarette lighters which was really easy and convenient but obviously not that great looking. 
Now moving on to where all this equipment should go, let's start with the uh, radar detector displays. Originally I was thinking of just cutting holes into the dash and inserting the displays that way, but they came up with much better ideas as far as maybe just having the radar detectors in a custom enclosure built around the primary display in my vehicle. We'd experimented with different locations for the different displays to see what works best, and we ultimately decided on having the Escort and the Redenso on the left and then the Stinger on the right. Now for the controllers for the ALP and Maxi i360, I was originally just thinking of drilling holes into the center console and then just flush mounting the controls that way. But when I got there, they actually had a much better idea of just installing them right into this kind of unused pocket down in the lower area of my center console. We then took all the remote mount radar detectors and inserted them into the lower air intake and luckily they all fit, no problem. For the front laser jammer heads, we had to basically just stuff the different grill slots with the heads to make sure that everything would fit in the first place, and luckily everything did fit. Even the center area, which had four different heads, <laughs> uh, an ALP regular head, ALP TX, uh, Escort, Shifter Max, and TMG. Now for all the different laser jammers, I had them all installed set up as triples. So three heads, kind of two on the outside and then one in the center. For the ALP, I have two different options. I have a regular head and a TX head, and I've got the ability to try both combinations for testing to see what works best. The escorts were a little bit weird because I could install them as maybe duels, I could do triples, which is what I ultimately wound up doing, or even a set of quads, but it was a little bit weird to say, you know, what's the best comparison with the other ones. I could do quads, but then the other ones are only running triple, so that's not fair, but it would be better for the escorts. I could do it, but ultimately I decided on going for a set of triples up front with the escorts to keep things even, and hopefully Escort comes out with a six head bridge box so that we can do three heads in the front and three heads in the rear. Now for the rear of the vehicle, I've done a set of ALP triples, so two regular heads and one TX head in the center. Then once we had an idea as far as where everything was gonna go, it was a matter of uh, just getting the car ready for the install. So they started doing things like ripping out the entire interior so that they have room to run cables, uh, taping up all of the edges of the bumper so that once they start putting body panels back together, nothing actually like hit something and kind of gets scratched or dented. So extra protection, towels, all sorts of protective things around the vehicle as they'd start to remove everything. I also really liked that they had this organizing box dedicated to all the nuts and screws and bolts so that everything they pulled out of the car could go in one place and then it ensures that everything goes back into the car once they're done. Now starting off with installing the front laser jammers, uh, I had my idea as far as where I wanted to go, but we kind of adjusted a little bit once we got in there, depending on what was going on with the bumper, how wide the slats were, and how far things kind of stuck out in front of the slat, just to make sure that uh, the heads were not recessed and there's nothing in front of the heads actually interfering with the jammers themselves. In the center of the vehicle, there's the Audi logo, for example, and that actually sticks out a little bit farther forward, and so the center heads actually have to be stuck out a little bit farther forward than the outer heads are. Now, once we figured out where everything was gonna go, they'd created these special holders for the laser jammer heads that were uh, first created in CAD and then laser cut as far as where every head was gonna be inserted. Then they basically custom built these special holders for all of the heads, which could then hold all the heads. They had the cables running out the back, and then you were able to insert this entire cluster of heads right into your grill and then secure them into place, which was awesome. Now something that we're gonna be adding to the install that's not actually done yet, we were able to do about 95% of the install, but we actually ran out of time by the very end, so I'm actually gonna be going back next week to get a couple more things done, and one of the things that we're gonna be doing is having removable Perspex covers on top of the laser jammer heads, and so when I'm driving, there's gonna be this black plastic essentially covering all the laser jammer heads so that they're not visible to the naked eye, but infrared light, like what comes out of a laser gun or a laser jammer, is still gonna be able to pass through without issue. Now, because I'm getting this vehicle specifically for testing and I don't want to introduce any other variables, uh, we're designing it with the uh, Perspex covers to actually be removable so that I can pop them off for testing and then also pop them back on and see is there an issue with them on or off, you know, for day-to-day -day driving versus testing with no barriers like that. Whereas normally the Perspex covers are going to be pretty much permanent in place. And the way that we're doing that is uh, behind the grill, kind of inside the slats, they actually installed some magnets. Now these magnets are gonna be there so that later we can take the Perspex covers and just kind of magnetically attach them into place and then whenever we need to, we can just pop them right off for testing. They're gonna be aligned really nicely once all is said and done and uh, once that is done, I'm actually gonna do a follow-up video with the final completed build. This is just gonna kind of go over most of the build plus kind of where we are today, which is 95% of the way there. Along the way, of course, because there's so many cables, uh, all the cables were nicely labeled to make it easy to tell, you know, what goes to what, which is kind of necessary when you've got, well, most people would do like two or three jammers up front or something. I've got 10 jammers. <laughs> 
up front three different systems plus two different combinations for the ALP center heads. And so 10 laser jammers and four different radar detectors up front. So luckily they did a really good job with labeling everything. Now, something I learned along the way was uh, the Escort laser shifter heads. There's now a second generation of the shifters. Uh, the first gen ones, as you guys know, they had some issues jamming the Dragon Eye and the performance was not where Escort wanted. Uh, well, they've done some software updates since the initial launch and they've kind of quietly updated uh, the jammer heads themselves. And so this is actually the second generation of the Escort Shifter Max jammers. You'll notice it's different because there's this little white piece of plastic wrapped around the connector. Plus, if you launch Escort Detector Tools Pro, their update software, and plug it into your radar detector, when you go into the options, you'll see that it'll actually tell you whether or not you have the first or second generation version of the Shifter Max heads. Now, I don't know exactly what was changed and exactly what the differences are. From what I understand, there's just been some physical hardware improvements for uh, Dragon Eye Jamming. There may be some other stuff too. Again, I don't know all the details, but uh, yeah, I've got uh, the second generation ones and just a quick heads up for those of you guys who have them and that's how actually how you can check. So once we get to testing, I'm really curious to see how these new versions do compared to the ALP and TMG and everything else. Speaking of jammers, I'm also gonna be installing the new Stinger fiber optic transmitters and receivers. Uh, it's all new hardware compared to their previous fiber optic only transmitters. They now have fiber for both the transmit and receive side. That's not gonna make it here in time for the professional build, but it should be pretty simple to install myself uh, just for testing. And so once those comes in, I like to add those in. And I'd also like to get a set of the uh, K40 diffuser optics, K40s, latest and greatest jammers. And so I'm gonna have five different laser jammer combinations that I'll be able to run. So that should be really cool. Now, for the rear of the vehicle, I'm running just ALPs. They're the best jammers on the market, and the front is just primarily for testing. The rear is like actually for just protection, so I'm doing a set of triples. Uh, two regular heads, a TX head in the center, and then when I go back to the installer next week, we're talking about the possibility of getting uh, Perspex housings for the outer heads to make it look better. We're kind of debating whether or not we want to do that depending on, well, budget and if I want to spend the extra money. Um, I think it would look really cool, and if we do wind up going that route, again, we're still not quite sure. Um, we're going to do it with removable Perspex covers, which again, is not the normal thing, but to remove those, so for testing, we can always test uh, with the covers on or off as needed. Now, I've tested with Perspex before in the past. I've done a video with a Model S, and uh, with the covers, it was jammed to gun and jammed from gun. It did a great job. It allows about 90% of infrared light to travel through, and so, um, yeah, it does diminish it a little bit, but not to the point where it actually affects the jamming performance. There's plenty of power there to spare either way. And so, yeah, it works great in practice from what I've seen with testing it before and what the installers have done. So we're gonna have the ability to do it, but I'm sure I'm just gonna run it with it on full time. Now, moving on to the front radar detectors. Uh, the three normal radar detectors with your horns, uh, the NetRadar, RCM, and MaxCI, those are all installed down in kind of the lower air intake area. They'd basically custom built this special mount uh, that can attach right to my vehicle's chassis. The radar detectors then pretty much screw directly onto this mount, and then because the mount is kind of screwed into my vehicle, they can actually go in and adjust the height of it as well to make sure that uh, it slots in nicely and it's not actually being blocked by my bumper in any way, which is awesome. So all of my front radar detectors with horns, uh, they're not installed behind the bumper. They're technically behind the bumper, but they do have a line of sight with nothing in front of the horns actually blocking the signal. Now the Stinger VIP, it's a little bit different. Uh, I was originally thinking of like, I don't know, slapping it onto the front of the vehicle or something, but that would be horribly ugly. And so we had a much better idea once we started going in there. The idea was actually installing it behind the fog light panel on the driver's side of the vehicle. Uh, there's no actual fog lights down there. And what's great is uh, that panel, it's a relatively flat piece of plastic. It's also easily removable, and if you take a look at the back side of the panel, you'll see there's kind of like an upper section and a lower section. Now, what's great is the uh, Stinger VIP's patch antenna. There's kind of like two halves to it, essentially. Uh, the half on the bottom, that's where all of the larger X-band patches are. On the top, you have the smaller K and KA band patches, and so if we just take the, uh, the antenna and put it right up against that panel, well, then the X-band patches will be unobstructed by the bottom panel, and then the K and KA band patches can go right through the top part of the panel, which is awesome. Again, for testing, it's super easy to remove that panel, and so I can always pop it off just to make sure there's nothing else in front of the um, radar detector, but I can also pop it back on, and it should be pretty minimal uh, impact to performance, if any, which is great. Now, as far as physically mounting the Stinger antenna, we actually used a spare uh, ALP head mount, and then just kind of like, you know, wrapped it around the Stinger antenna, and then uh, mounted that to the inside of my vehicle. It was kind of funny, my installer comes up to me later and he's like, uh, so we've got the Stinger mounted and it is 0.37 degrees off. <laughs> a third of a degree from being perfectly straight. And I just started laughing and I'm like, yeah, that is totally fine. You're good to go. 
Now, in order to then run all of these cables back into the vehicle, they actually drilled a hole into my firewall on the driver's side. So all of these cables are gonna run through the firewall and then into the vehicle, and then they sealed everything up with silicone to make sure that uh, there's no water that leaks in or out. Well, out, just in, you know, from the rain or anything, doesn't wanna get into the cabin. You'll also notice that all of the cables are nicely protected, and I'll get into this in just a minute once we get into all of the cabling stuff. Now, moving on to the dash cam batteries. Uh, I've got a Blackview B124, as well as a Cellink Neo and the Cellink Neo expansion. Uh, so as far as my dash cam setup, I've got the Blackview DR900S and the Blackview DR750S in the rear. Um, I'm using then their rear cameras as like my side cameras. And so I've got pretty much four cameras and to power all this for parking mode, I've got three different battery packs. And so I'm running the Blackview battery for my front cam and then the cell link for the rear. And a fun fact, you can take the cell link expansion and plug it into the Blackview battery and it works just fine. They're the same batteries under the hood, just with different branding and a different app or whatever. In any event, to install the batteries, we actually found a good spot in the rear next to the spare tire where there was a little bit of a gap. And then to install them, they actually built this special plate for the dash cam batteries to rest on. The plate has neoprene on both sides to help uh, dampen any vibration and of course protect the batteries too. And then to secure the mount itself, they actually drilled holes into my vehicle's body and then were able to screw the plate in to these newly created holes that they put on, which is awesome. Then they popped in the batteries, strapped them into place, and they were good to go. And I love it that I've still got easy access to all the wiring and switches and everything that I need. And so in case I ever need to change anything or adjust settings, it's all right there and it's nice and accessible for me. Now, as far as powering all this stuff, this was a little bit tricky initially because uh, all the fuses here that I was accessing, I was noticing like if I turn the car off, the fuses all stay on. They're not ignition triggered the way that I want and I don't want uh, all this stuff staying on when I shut my car off. Now, the way we got around that is everything that's actually wired directly into the battery in the rear of my vehicle. Also in the rear of the vehicle, there was a 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter that actually was ignition triggered. And so that actually goes on and off with the car. And so what they did is they installed a pair of relays. These relays essentially look to the cigarette lighter to see when the car is on and off. And when it's on, they then allow power to flow from the battery to all of the different electronics. Uh, there was one relay that's being used for all the different radar detectors and laser jammers and a second relay that's being used just for the dash cam batteries. Now, everything is actually gonna be powered off of this brick essentially called a Rig Runner 4008. It's got eight expansion ports for you to plug in all sorts of different systems and each one has its own fuse. It uses these power pole connectors which you crimp onto the uh, power and ground of your different equipment and then it slides right into place and so it gives you a nice solid connection. We uh, used almost all of them and we also created one uh, that's a cigarette lighter port because we actually got rid of the cigarette lighter port in the back that we're using for the, uh, the relays and replaced it with something else which I'll get into here towards the end but we still created another one to make it easy for me to uh, plug in something for temporary usage in the back and further testing. And there was also, it's nice, uh, one other one was left free so I can, for future expansion, plug in something else. And then of course, everything there was labeled to make it nice and easy to tell what's what. Now this thing worked out great with one minor exception. <laughs> uh, it would actually constantly throw over voltage errors even though uh, when all the stuff was installed, there were no voltage issues. So as I'm driving, the thing is screaming in the back over voltage. And so I had to contact the manufacturer and there's ways to disable the alarm. Uh, you basically have to pop the unit open, find the jumpers inside and then remove the jumpers. And then once you do that, it removes the over voltage or under voltage errors. I'm not exactly sure why it was throwing those errors in the first place, because again, the voltage levels are fine. Uh, the maximum voltage level is 15 volts and it was never going above 14.8 or 14.9. And so the company's actually sending me out a replacement one for this one. And hopefully the new one doesn't have that same issue, but uh, other than that, it's been a really cool system as far as powering everything. Now, if you guys remember from my Miata uninstall video to power everything, I'd been using all these different T-taps uh, and I'd had a couple issues with them and I talked to the installers about them and they said they actually hate these things. And it turns out some of the issues that I saw are things that they've seen and some other ones. So like, for example, what I found is sometimes like the connections in here that things would slot in wouldn't always be that great. And I would see that sometimes with some of my radar detectors actually would power off while I'm driving and I would just kind of like, kick the cables they were all down there um, to just tr try to get it to power back up or maybe kind of reach under there and just kind of jiggle it until it would go. And then I would go back later and kind of like redo the connectors and stuff, but they would never quite sit right and be like totally solid and reliable. Something else that they mentioned that I didn't really think of is uh, the way they work, they kind of bite through the insulation into the metal wire underneath. But what happens is there's a lot of thin individual strands of wire. And when you start cutting into them and breaking them, you're reducing how many wires are actually going through the, uh, the cable here. And well, basically reducing how much current can go through the wire. And when you're 
cutting out how much power can go through already, plus adding in a bunch of other stuff, you just start kind of like reducing the quality and the power capabilities of all of your wiring in the first place. And so they actually never use these things at all. And so I'm actually really glad that I'm switching over to the new uh, rig runner instead for the power. I think this is a lot better. Now back there, we also installed all of the CPUs for the different radar detectors and laser jammers, except for the TMG. Now this was actually one of my favorite parts is all the stuff back there. It's in the back passenger side of my vehicle. The reason that we chose to install it there was uh, normally the stuff is installed in the front. And like in my Miata, I had my ALPs tucked up under the passenger footwell. I had the Redenso in the back. I had the Stinger in my dash. I mean, I just kind of shoved everything everywhere, just wherever I could find room. But with a lot of systems, you know, there wasn't necessarily room for all that. Plus, I wanted a centralized location for everything to be all in one place. Now, doing that did mean that there's a lot of extra cabling to run. Usually, it's only the rear jammers and radar detector where you have to run all the extension cables, right? In this case, we've got a bunch of stuff mounted all up in the front. All the radar detectors, all of the laser jammers, all of that cabling then has to be routed all the way to the back of the vehicle to plug into the CPUs and then run all the way back up into the front for your displays and your controllers and your speakers and your alert LEDs. And so there was a lot of cabling to run all throughout the vehicle. That was maybe the downside of it, but the upside is now I have this beautiful area in the back with all of the CPUs and it makes it super easy for me to go in and maybe with the ALP change if the front center sensor is a regular sensor or a TX sensor or if I need to show something for videos everything is right in one place which is awesome and I love it. Now, the way that this panel was created, they first just kind of made out a template and cut it to fit to make sure that it was the right size. Then they laid out all of the different CPUs to figure out where they should go. Then they used that template to cut out a piece of plastic made out of high density polyethylene or HDPE. That panel is what all of the brains are gonna be attached to. However, the texture of that material actually kind of prevents uh, the CPUs from being able to attach to it. And so uh, what they did is they actually created some special plates for the CPUs to actually attach onto and then the plates would then attach to the main panel itself. So to do this, they went into CAD and they custom created all of the different plates and then had these laser cut as well. Something else that I love that it's a little thing, but it's awesome is they used a special countersink bit that actually kind of cuts this V-shaped groove into these different plates. And so once you screw in the screw, the screws will actually sit flush on the plate and not actually stick out. That was a really nice touch. Then they went and uh, sanded and painted the plates to make them all look good. And then once they screwed them into the panel, then they used a 3M dual lock. It's kind of like a hard Velcro. And then they attached that to all the different plates and then attached the CPUs directly onto this 3M dual lock. And that way I'm easily able to pop them off and put them back on as needed. Now, once they figured out exactly where the CPUs are gonna go and everything, then we had to figure out a lot of the cable management stuff. Now, behind this panel, there was a bunch of extra space that we didn't really need to use to stuff in anything, and so we actually just ran a lot of the cables from back behind into the CPUs on the front, and they actually cut holes into the main panel for all the cables to then run into. They then uh, labeled everything, and they used these special colored dots that match on both the cables and on the CPUs to make it easier to tell where everything goes and match it all up, which is pretty handy. Um, some of the cables, the dots do tend to fall off, so maybe like, uh, I know they were kind of experimenting with this since there were so many things going on here. Um, and so some of them didn't quite stick on completely, but I think that was a really awesome idea. I love the extra color coding in addition to all the labeling. And then once they got everything mounted there, it was time to start wiring everything up and hooking it all up and running the cables. And uh, so a couple things about the cables that I really loved. Um, they used a lot of the factory cables, but uh, for all the extensions that they had to do, they actually custom made their own extension cables. They had these huge spools of wire that they'll uh, unroll and then they'll just cut to length. Then for all of the cables, they basically expose all of the wires, they make all the connections that they need and then solder the different wires together. Then they'll protect them with heat shrink and then they'll seal everything up. And then once all the cables are in place, they start wrapping everything with uh, protective Tessa tape. It's the same thing that you'll actually see the uh, automotive manufacturers use to protect the cables. Uh, there's an interior version and an exterior version. Uh, for most vehicles, they use maybe about a half a roll to a roll typically. For my car, with everything that they put in, it was about 12 to 15 rolls of tape. It was crazy. They kept like running out of tape and having to go get more for all the insanity that was going on here. With all the seats and everything ripped out, uh, they started running cables along the side, uh, down along the trim. Everything, of course, had to be uh, zip-tied in place and made nice and clean. 
And they also added a couple extra spools that I would be able to tap into later and maybe crip on a different connector. So for future expansion, there's some unused cables that I'm gonna be able to use. And that was a nice touch. Now, remember how I mentioned uh, all the CPUs are mounted in the back? Uh, there is one exception, it's the TMG CPU. That's actually mounted down here uh, up in the front of the vehicle. The reason we wanted to do that is uh, there's no external speaker for the TMG. The CPU is actually built in to the CPU itself. Escort and Redenso also have this, but they have uh, headphone jacks so that you can wire in speakers and all the speakers are down here uh, behind the steering wheel. With the TMG CPU, because I'm not gonna be able to hear it if it's all the way back there, we had to mount it up here in the front. Plus I still needed to be accessible to do things like manually JTK if I want, or maybe more importantly, change the volume or press the update buttons to update the jammers or push the little pin on the side if I wanna update the control set. So I still need physical access to it, um, but I don't want it to be anywhere visible. I'm rarely gonna actually run it. It's primarily for testing, but I definitely don't want it like visibly installed the way some people do. I wanted it kind of tucked away, which then does make it a little bit harder to go in and disable the jammers or interface with it. But uh, the solution that we found for it is there's this pocket here next to my left knee. And if you open it up, that's where the TMG CPU is inserted. I'm easily able to access it to, uh, you know, press the update buttons or make any sort of changes that I need. Unfortunately, it does kind of take up uh, this extra pocket here. However, it's not a pocket that I think I'm gonna be using all that much. And something else that helps out is uh, they put some more 3M dual lock on the bottom of the CPU and then I'm able to just kind of press it up on the top of the pocket area. That way I'm still able to lay stuff down on the bottom. Uh, we wanna potentially go in later and maybe change it to like a magnetic mount that I can just attach it. That way that will work a little bit better than the, uh, the dual lock, but uh, that's where it is. Something else that's really nice is uh, there's extra slack on the cable so that if I need to pull out the CPU uh, to make maybe change anything or whatever, I can do that. And then I can put it back in and push the cable back in. And that way it's not just coiled up inside that pocket area and it gives me more room in there. Uh, one other thing about the TMG and it's nice that I can pull the cable out is uh, if I press the button to turn off the CPU, the next time I turn the car back on, it's gonna power itself back on. Uh, it's like the R3 does that as well. Whereas like the Max 360C, if you power it off, it'll actually stay off until you power it back on. Pros and cons to both solutions, I guess. And it's nice if you're running it as your primary jammer, but for me, I'm gonna actually have to go in and physically unplug the power cable. And then whenever I wanna use the TMG, I'm gonna go in and actually plug the power cable back in and then close it all up and use it that way. So all that, I guess it's a good note. For those of you guys who wanna use a TMG, there is no remote kill switch. There is no external speaker. There's no external alert LED. Everything itself contained in the CPU, which uh, if that's cool with you, great. But if you want maybe a little bit more configurability, you might have to choose a different system. Now, moving on back to the back real quick. Remember how I mentioned we had the uh, 12 volt cigarette lighter that we were using for the relays, but we actually removed that? Well, in its place, they actually cut out a hole in that panel and they've replaced it with this special custom made USB panel. So this panel has slots for all of the different systems that are updatable via USB. And so I have one place where I can just go in and plug right in to update my Stinger or my ALP or my Redenso or my Escorts or whatever I need. Everything is right there in one place and it's awesome. It makes it so much easier to update all my systems. We were thinking originally of uh, doing that in the glove box. There's a spot in the glove box that we could use, but uh, it was a lot more convenient to do it in the back and then not have to run all the cables all the way up. And so we actually opted for that. And I actually really, really like that solution. It worked out great. Now, as far as the rear radar detectors for the uh, Redenso, the Escort, and the Net Radar, if you pop off the rear bumper, you'll see that they'd actually created another custom plate for all of the radar detectors to sit onto. It's installed above the metal part of the bumper, so nothing is gonna be messing with the actual signal, and I've got that installed back there for arrows for all the different systems. And of course, they also did a great job with measuring everything to make sure everything is perfectly level and straight, so yeah, everything is just beautifully done here. Then the cables for the rear radar detectors run to the right onto the passenger side of the vehicle and then come in on the side where all of the CPUs are located. Now for the rear laser jammers, those are all installed in the standard place, kind of in the rear deck lid uh, above the license plate and then off to either side. We had to go and do some measurements to make sure that uh, everything was installed in the proper place. So like, you know, the regular ALP sensors were no more than 24 inches apart, um, but then the ALP sensor and the TX sensor were no closer than eight inches. And so with the placement of my car, everything is pretty much right on the edge and it should be really nice. There's no Perspex covers here yet. Again, that's something that we're gonna be looking into potentially adding in later, but uh, right now they're actually just installed right onto the vehicle. And of course, made sure they're installed nice and level. I didn't want them tucked super far back or anything. And so they're pretty much flush uh, with the edge of the deck lid. Um, like maybe one corner is flush and the other one is just like a millimeter or two back. Um, and that's just kind of, I guess, the trade-off as far as uh, looks versus performance. If I find that I'm being like a millimeter or two back where the uh, body panel starts to curve is an issue in testing, I can just pop it off and 
slide it forward just a little bit and it's not a big deal. It's gonna be really easy to adjust there. So that's great. One other nice thing, uh, the TX sensor, we didn't wanna put it right next to the backup camera. It would kind of get in the way there. And so it's on the left side of my uh, kind of release switch for the back hatch. And it makes it really easy for me now to tell exactly where it is. Now, as far as the no photo, we were originally thinking of installing it, but when we were looking back here, we actually decided to cut the no photo. The reason that we wanted to do that is uh, if we install the no photo on the top of the license plate, well, it kind of gets in the way with the backup camera, and so that wouldn't be good. If we put it on the bottom of the license plate, that's what we were thinking of doing. It's kind of thick on the back, and it would push the license plate itself a little bit farther away from the vehicle and then physically block my hand's access to get to the release switch to open the rear hatch. And it's for that reason that we decided to just get rid of installing the no photo altogether. Now the GPS antennas for all the different equipment, those are also installed in the rear. We were thinking maybe initially, could I put them here, you know, just underneath the dash, but there's not enough room in there. And so they were looking around the vehicle and we actually installed the GPS antenna, believe it or not, in the rear spoiler. So they popped the spoiler off my car and started looking around inside for a good place to put them. And uh, yeah, they were actually able to find the place to install four different GPS antennas. So Stinger, uh, Redenso, ALP, and Escort. And luckily I've tested all the systems and yeah, they work great. So that's awesome. Be a little bit tough to ever remove back there. I mean, a lot of the stuff is pretty permanently put in place. And I was kind of thinking, oh, I'll just keep the car for maybe four years or something. But with all this in place, like, ugh, I think I'm gonna have to keep it longer. <laughs> Now, as for the dash cams, I mentioned I've got a four channel dash cam. So normally with the two channel system, you have a front camera and a secondary rear camera. I'm running two primary systems. So DR900S in the front, DR750S in the rear, and then their rear cameras off on the side. So this way I've got coverage all around the vehicle. Now the side cameras I'd mounted kind of toward the rear because that's the only place I can mount it on a window that's not going to be going up and down and I can just be assured that it's not ever going to have any issues if I open and close the window. They are a little bit farther back and so it might be kind of limited coverage here out of these windows, but it's going to be nice in case anything happens on the side of the vehicle or somebody approaches my car from the side, I've just got that extra coverage. It's a little bit weird to watch that dash cam footage while you're driving, but I guess it's primarily just going to be in case anything happens from the side or while I'm parked, again, just to get the extra field of view. Now, moving on to uh, kind of the interface and everything up here in the front where I'm actually using it. Now, for the radar detector displays, again, we'd kind of experimented with a couple different locations, and I was thinking initially of actually like drilling into the vehicle's uh, body panels and everything, but uh, they actually created some special holders for all of the different radar detector displays, which is awesome. We were thinking initially of actually mounting it down lower, but there's some issues with uh, a kind of part of my instrument cluster actually blocking some of the area next to the vehicle's display. And it's for that reason that they actually installed them a little bit higher up. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the mounted up higher location. It kind of gets in the way if I'm trying to reach up to the front to mess with the uh, windshield not radar detector or something. And I think it also kind of looks like Mickey Mouse or something. <laughs> and they also agreed, like, I think it would be a little bit better to mount it lower. There's a little bit of extra room here on the sides. And so if we uh, kind of shrink that down, we should be able to mount it lower. And so when I go back to the installers next week, we're actually going to be uh, looking at uh, kind of redoing that mount and mounting it down lower. And I think that's actually going to work better. Now that said, I love having them mounted right here. They're right here in my field of view so I can see them while I'm driving. They're super accessible. I really, really like this solution. I know you can install them like into the rear view mirror and stuff. That's great if you had maybe one radar detector, but with all these different systems, I needed a way to install a bunch of different things. And this is way better than just using double stick tape and slapping it onto my dash, <laughs> which is what I did in my Miata. Now, moving on to the controllers, we've got the ALP and the Max CI, which have their own separate dedicated controllers that I want up here. I was thinking originally of just kind of drilling down here uh, into my center console and then just sticking them in and having them flush mounted, but they came up with a way better idea. Uh, there's this pocket here down in the front um, that I never really use for anything, and uh, we decided to use that for the controllers. And so once they had all the dash pulled out of the car, they took this panel and actually dremeled a hole in the back of it for all the cables to run through. They created custom mounts for the controllers and then they had everything installed right here. It's super convenient. It's easy to reach to adjust settings to do anything that I need. And uh, something else that we want to do that we did run out of time for that we're going to be doing uh, next time I go back is I want a removable cover to place over top of everything. That way it's out of sight. Uh, I mentioned in my last video that I didn't necessarily like this kind of stuff, but actually using it. Now I'm actually really seeing the value of it. It's nice to have it covered when you don't necessarily need it because some things like adjusting the volume or the display brightness or the sensitivity, it's not actually really something that you're gonna be doing all that often. Once you get it dialed in, you're good to go and you just close it all off and then it looks 
beautiful in OEM. Now that said, there are times that you actually need to press the buttons to do things like for the ALP if you want to JTK to disable the jammers or for the escort system if you want to mute your radar detector or manually lock out a signal or if you're using the escort shifters if you want to disable the jammers you've got to double press the mute button and that's tough to do if you've got the <laughs> controllers actually covered. And so what they did is they custom created two hidden remote buttons for both the ALP and the escort. Interference detection only. And this I love. Now for these right here in the front of the vehicle, there's two kind of unused button on the either side of my parking sensor buttons. And so these two buttons we used for the ALP and the Mac CI 360. Now this was a cool process to see how they actually got these buttons to be usable. So what they did is once they took this all out, they started taking the whole panel apart from behind and uh, there's these little white stoppers inside that uh, once they pulled out, uh, it allowed the buttons to actually then move freely. Now, one of the concerns is if I'm pressing these buttons that aren't supposed to be used, if they're doing something for equipment that I don't have installed in the vehicle, it could potentially cause some issues. And so what they did is they actually removed the buttons that were there, uh, disconnected them, desoldered them, and then physically removed them off of the vehicle. And then they started experimenting with different buttons to put in its place. With the different buttons, they would experiment to make sure that the uh, the action was correct, the feel was good, they sounded just like the OEM buttons, just to make everything seem like OEM. And then once they found some buttons that they liked, they went ahead and soldered those into place, and then, uh, you know, soldered in the wiring to then hook up to the ALP controller and the Mac CI controller. Now to wire into the ALP controller, you can just wire into the back of the button itself. With the Escort controller, it's a little bit more difficult because this is all digital. The older 9500 CIs used to be a lot easier to work on because they were analog, but now with the new controllers on the Mac CI, it takes them about an hour and a half to actually go in and solder the connections into the back of the mute button. And so something cool that I didn't know about that Escort is doing now is for installers who do this kind of stuff a lot, they actually make special versions of the controller that have wires coming out of the back, which are designed specifically to give you a remote remote mute button, which is awesome. The standard controller doesn't have that, but these new custom ones that custom installers can get allow this part to become much, much easier when it already has the proper cabling necessary. Then once they hook these wires up to these hidden buttons, now I've got uh, dedicated buttons just for uh, disabling my jammers or muting the radar detector, which was really coming in handy because on the drive home, you know, I was practicing. These are new buttons. I'm not used to all this. So while I was driving, I was practicing and everything. And sure enough, on the drive home, I got lit up with laser. Ahead. I'm really glad that I had practiced because uh, I was able to JTK really quick and actually start to get that built into my muscle memory and not flounder or whatever. I was able to disable the jammers. I think it was like 2.4 seconds. <laughs> Only. So I'm really glad that I had the dedicated buttons and I'm really glad that I had practiced. So definitely whenever you get a new system or something, that's something really important to do so that once everything happens, you can be on the brakes and hit the button. Now I had practiced with the JTK button, but one thing that I didn't practice was hitting the brakes. And this is a new car to me. And so um, the speed limit where I was driving was 70, but uh, when I slowed down, I actually slowed all the way down to 60. So I kind of overcooked the brakes, um, but I got the JTK part great. So I also need to practice that. So speaking of practicing, do that as well. Just make sure there's nobody behind you so they don't slam into you when you're practicing. Now, when you get shot with radar and laser, uh, I wanted the LEDs for both the ALP and the Max CI 360 to be visible on the dash cam so you can actually see like for the ALP when it goes off, you can watch in promo to see how long he shoots you for or not. Uh, with the Escort, uh, it was cool. It actually lights up. So for radar, it lights up red in the front and then blue in the back. And so even though my dash cam isn't able to see my displays right here on my dash, I can still see the LEDs and tell what's going on, which is really, really helpful. Now to create the LEDs, I didn't want just the LEDs themselves sticking up. And so they actually created a little housing for me for the LEDs to sit inside of. Then they kind of sanded it down, textured it, painted it, and made it look good. And something else they did is uh, the LEDs themselves, they can be kind of bright, especially when they're pointed directly into your eyeballs at night. So one little touch is they actually sand the LEDs themselves to kind of diminish the light output, which is really nice. Uh, speaking of light output, the ALP LED, it's a little bit brighter than the Escort is. They told me the Escort runs at 3.3 volts, whereas the ALP runs at 3.7 volts. So it's inherently a little bit brighter than the Escort, but probably not a huge deal. Um, one thing that we did run into is um, I was actually doing the LED tests and stuff for the different systems and uh, the ALP LED powered on, but I didn't realize that the red LED, um, the wire wasn't actually like, I guess, 
connected properly. And so that doesn't actually work. And so when I go back next week, I need to have them actually uh, reconnect the red wire. But other than that, everything else is still good. It lights up, you know, blue and green and everything, just not red. So that's something that will get taken care of. But nevertheless, I love having both LEDs right there. That is awesome. Something else that they did is for the Escort system, they cut the green wire. With the Escort, the green is always powered on, and it can be kind of annoying to have a green LED staring in the face. So they actually cut the green, and then you're red for front and blue for back. It also glows and lights up when you get shot with laser. I do run the Escort shifters in receive only mode, so that way when I get shot with laser, it can automatically report out to Escort Live for me and alert everybody else. Um, but then the ALP is the one that actually does the jamming. And then finally, once everything is all done, they get the car all put back together again. They got to plug in the computer and check for any error codes to uh, fix anything that wasn't you know, put back together properly. Or if there's just an error that says, hey, something has been disconnected, they can clear the error codes as necessary. And so overall here, looking around in the car, I am so happy with this package. It's beautiful. Everything is so well thought out. It's so well installed. It's awesome. Like I love this setup. It's gonna make it so easy for me to easily test and compare a variety of different systems. Uh, all in all, with my uh, visit next week, it should take about another day or so. It should be about 80 hours worth of labor. So it's quite a bit of work, but it is way better than anything I could have dreamed of and obviously way better than anything I could have done myself. My install, of course, it's very different than most other installs. They've never had anybody install more than two systems before. Usually at most, it's like a remote radar detector and a remote laser jammer. I've got a whole bunch of different systems. And so my install, it's very different than uh, you know anything else that they've done before, but they did a fantastic job with it and I highly recommend them. Uh, if you guys are interested in having work done on your car too, um, I'll put their information on screen or down in the video description. You can call them up and get a quote on your car. Um, and of course, it all depends on what car you have, uh, how hard it is to work on, how much custom work you want, what systems you want installed, all that kind of stuff. So if you guys are interested, give them a call. They're based here in Portland, Oregon. Um, there's a lot of great installers all over the country, so you can you know, use a variety of people if you'd like to work with them. They also uh, have cars shipped in all the time from all over the country. So even if you're not local to the Pacific Northwest, they can still work on your car. And yeah, I definitely recommend them. They're who I went to go spend my money on, you know? Um, now, as far as the rate, luckily they did give me a bit of a discounted rate just because, you know, I'm helping them out with the video and everything and kind of industry stuff and whatnot. Um, and Escort also helped cover the cost of some of the installation. When I contacted them asking for a Max CI 360, I didn't have one of those yet. You know, Stinger and Rodenso, a number of companies had sent over equipment. I asked Escort to do the same and they obliged, which was nice, a big thank you. They also offered to help cover a part of the installation cost, which was a big help. The Max CI 360, it's not a system that you can get uh, online. You have to go to an installer to buy it. and. Uh, because of that, they also wanted to help cover some of the installation costs. And so obviously not the whole thing. It's not like everything here is an Escort product, but you know, some of it is of course. And so thanks to them for helping out. Thanks to Musicar for helping me out. You guys did amazing work. I'm super happy with this. I'm super excited and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys next week and then getting more testing and more videos done for all of you guys. And so for those of you guys, uh, wanting to see more, make sure you're subscribed to stay tuned to all the testing and all the comparisons and everything now that I've got this amazing new setup here that I love. You know, I'm definitely going to be using it more to create more videos. That's the whole point of all of this. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask down in the comment area. Hop onto the forums for more discussion. Uh, if you want any of the stuff that I'm putting in here, uh, again, I'm going to have all the stuff linked to in the video description. So there's going to be a ton of information in there about all the different equipment that was installed in the vehicle too. So again, thanks to you guys. Thanks to everybody helping out with the install. And this should be fun. Thank you for watching. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.